awesome. Well, you know what? Um, um, I think that these things, corn mazes, hay rides, the Halloween haunt or the Halloween hop as it was called in the 50s, it's an evolution of that. People went to get their pumpkin, took a hay ride. Maybe there's something scary about it. Or they walked through a corn maze, but then the ha the seasonal haunted house like you're talking about. And the JCs, I totally remember that. Yeah, yeah. But then they become permanent and then they become huge. Let's take a look. But every fall for over 40 years, our focus shifts a little to scaring the heck out of you. We take great pride in our grade A organic fed zombies. All right, so that's what we see a lot of today, and these huge companies huge mostly theme parks i mean there are some permanent houses that aren't related to theme parks but these events are pretty big that's pretty terrifying looking right well as halloween horror nights alone now uh you know when i started with it there was still a little bit of that element of the little rascals you know let's put on a sure show. but if you but let me stop there everybody so as uh in his career with Universal and uh, not in his current state but years ago you had a major part in creating uh, Halloween Horror Nights tell them what you did to get it going or to get when you were there what you did well, uh, I worked, uh, I, I'm probably most known uh, for a show called Bill and Ted's Excellent Halloween Adventure, but on the, on the haunted house side of things, um, I would say my biggest contribution was trying to evolve the houses from a, a JC's-like loose collection of unrelated scares into legitimate stories that you were experiencing, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it got to the point where um, we developed documents that I call Bibles for each house that would lay out the three act structure for the story oh and go through all the characters and whatever backstory that the actors would need. So it was really evolving the experience from kind of a, a just a series of unrelated boo scares to an actual story. And then long after I left, they took that even further and that evolved ultimately into the icons that were created. I was going to say, we talked about events. these uh, horror icons, whether they're Freddy or Jason, there's even the Universal Monsters who've had some great houses, by the way, in yeah. this recent past. But yeah, they would be a theme to an entire uh, a haunted house or, or a maze And part there. of the, the evolution I was uh, yeah. referring to was today, you are getting screen quality production design. Absolutely. So t today, especially after years and years of, of seeing how the sausage is made and helping make the sausage, for me, the pleasure is to go into those houses and just feel like I'm walking through film quality sets, especially some of the houses that are based on well-known IP. I love that because as a lifelong fan, I am now living movies in a way that that would have been impossible growing up and would be impossible in any kind of permanent attraction but for six weeks or whatever it is because uh, uh halloween is turning into like a food and wine festival be like 37 <laughs> you... weeks this year <laughs> yeah, you know? it will be 52 <laughs> <laughs> but um you know for that period of time i i can walk through the exorcist or poultry the quality or... of these is amazing and it's amazing that they aren't permanent yeah, because absolutely. you look through it. I mean, you've seen them before where you're like, the production value is insane. And you're like, how is this not permanent? Where do they put all this crap? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, it's, you know, warehouses just filled course, with, filled with, it, it. with uh, horrific things. So I love that you said that you created, took it from those those jump, just random jump scares to, to a storyline. Uh, what are some of the best or your favorite um, story haunts or mazes that you worked on? One of them I remember, I think it was the last year I was there, uh, Titanic was, you know, number one movie at uh. theaters for like almost the entire year. So uh, this was a little bit playful, not no less scary, but we did a house called Frightanic that was about <laughs> this... Uh, cruise ship that went through some kind of phenomenon between Hawaii and Los Angeles and oh when it ported it was a death ship and uh, but, but basically it was like we, we were able to do the haunted house equivalent of Titanic the year that Titanic came out and people really gravitated to that and then we explored the tropes we had uh, a haunted house set in high school that uh -huh. we called uh, Hell High, Hell High. Um, we had a lot of uh, film related haunted houses and museum based attractions that allowed us to 
take different well-known properties and put them in a way, put, put them together in a way that made story sense and yet allowed you to pull in multiple monsters, multiple characters. You could really mount, you could make a bigger story out of all yeah, putting yeah, them together. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm amazed. Anyone watching, you, you're hearing Jason talking. You're going, I didn't realize so much was going into this, but there's a lot more than just, um, you know, blood, sweat, and tears. You're talking about thought. Yeah, thought. absolutely. And Halloween then, and more so now. Like now, Halloween at Universal is legitimately a 365 operation. Yeah. Something is going on at some point in the year, and they're planning for the next Halloween well before this year's even it's like the olympics they're probably universal. talking about yeah, the yeah, third absolutely. one ahead right yeah it's like it's, instead of the olympic Com committee it's the halloween, halloween horror nights yeah. so halloween horror nights uh if you don't know the first year was called fright nights based like, on a nights, film 1991 uh, 1991 yeah. three nights only but fright night was actually one of those i love that horror it was amazing and movie. that left a mark on me because it was the first year that i had moved down here and again uh growing up outside cleveland with just these sort of regional jc's kind yeah. of haunted houses even the first Fright Nights attraction, uh, I will never forget walking onto a bridge. And I may even be making some of this up because, you know, how Mandela. Mem your, your, your memories kind of warp. But I have a memory of walking onto a bridge and the creature from the Black Lagoon coming out of the really? water and grabbing my leg. And it was, and I, was, I just remember thinking, this is unbelievable. Yeah. And, and that was back when we still had the Psycho House and the Bates Motel yes, on the line. Which were part of those early days yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. And because uh, they had filmed Psycho 4 there uh, prior to Universal okay. Orlando opening to the public. Um, but that was really my first taste of how you can really up your game in the in the Halloween genre and, and do these uh, not only film inspired, but film level quality. quality. Experience. And from a studio, you'd expect that. Yeah, when you absolutely. say film level, I'm thinking it, sh it should expect it that way. Yeah. This is awesome. I loved going. Universal Halloween Horror Nights is that the the mama. Yeah, because absolutely. SeaWorld now here in Orlando having their inaugural year. I went and. Um, it was nice. I will say when we came in and it started, it got a five. When we left, it's definitely a solid seven. But is there an inaugural year? So Hallow Scream has been at Bush Gardens for a long time, and it's been at other Sea Worlds, but it's finally here in Orlando. Their four haunts were pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, their uh, their show was the Creme de la Creme, mm -hmm. not a Bill and Ted, but it was an excellent, excellent high energy show. They have some things to learn. Their food sucked ass, but. <laughs> But you know what? Love Sea World still. Um, but yeah, there's Hollow Screams. There is so, I, so a cheer yeah. within a jeer. There to use an old a TV cheer guy and a jeer. It, it, oh my God! We talked about TV Guide. Check out Popcorn Live about network uh, sitcoms and uh, the TV Guide on the last episode. So yeah, um, I love that it's kind of the mama and people are still evolving. So it was like the first, and then you get to your your Six Flags and Disney, which will not go scary at all. Still has a Halloween event, so you can still at least mm -hmm. consider it going. We all need to get into this business, right? Yeah, absolutely. And the, you know they provide a. a different sort of experience for a different audience and that's an audience that we uh, that universal wouldn't go near for Correct. obvious reasons yeah. because we have such an established event that you're not going to deviate from that so i'm going to have the family type well, no, because my son who loves scary things and he's seven he keeps asking can i go to halloween hornets and i'm like Please trust me. You're remembering the time that it, Satan was yeah, yelling at you. It's not a good idea. <laughs> you will thank me. Your future yeah. therapist will thank me. Well, I love You're a Sorel. You will be in therapy. I can promise you. Here in Orlando, we had a, a permanent haunt a long time ago, Terror on Church Street, which I loved to go to yeah. uh, back then. And, and that was my first in, uh, foray into like, there's permanent structures. Now, there have been some that have come and gone in Orlando too, but it's, it's an epicenter. King, yeah. Skull King Kingdom. Kingdom. Even one called the Haunted Mansion, a yeah. different one uh, in another. But speaking of the Haunted Mansion, that is a permanent location. It's a permanent haunted house with a great history. We're not going to get into its history, but you know, Walt Disney World, Disneyland, and the other Disney theme parks around the world, a permanent site of a very famous haunted uh, mansion is exciting and it really has I think a lot of historical background that everyone else has played off of yeah, and um, it also made a movie so uh, I have a book here that I, I've had for some time now actually when did this come out that one came out in 2003, uh, coinciding with the release of the, the film, the Eddie Murphy. The film, film, yeah. So, The Haunted Mansion, From the Magic Kingdom to the Movies by Jason Sorrell. So this book, uh, like you said, is a correlation of how the Eddie Murphy Haunted Mansion movie um, kind of relates to the background of the Haunted Mansion. So being a former Imagineer, you got to publish this book just by, did you ask, did they say, could you write this? 
I asked. I basically, it was a book that I wanted to read, and it okay. was in the summer of 2002, and I remember asking my vice president uh, at Imagineering here in Florida, I said, how do we go about pitching a book? And he goes, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Email Marty. Marty Sklar, yeah. who was still head of Imagineering still. at the time, you know, plucked out of UCLA by Walt Disney himself. Uh, so I emailed him, and it was basically something of a covert op, because I, I said, we would, the, the company would probably never put out a book on the Haunted Mansion attraction on its own, why don't we position it mm, as a film tie-in tie -in so it's really about the making of the movie? Because that's cross-promotional and it's definitely going to exactly, market the film. but we, we can slide in the biography of the attraction yeah. in that way, and that was how it came about. But I love it because, again, what was the year? I'm sorry. Uh, 2003 is when it came out. You know, 2007 is when most smartphones, social media wasn't even out. So yeah. you can see some fantastic documentaries, whether it's a YouTube documentary or something official, but there's some great information and beautiful pictures in here. I was wondering if you would sign it for me. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Right, right now, have, apparently. Right now, so, right what, now. What better use of airtime could you have? Well, while you I do that, I might talk. I just think it's fantastic. I've had this book since then, and now I have it actually have you here to do that. No, you're going to play a game in a minute. It's the last game. We're going to play a little... Uh, I don't know if it'll be harder, but... It'll have a unique second part. So, the final girl. The final girl trope. Fan a lot of people say it's uh, Sigourney Weaver and Alien, but you can't really count that sci-fi as much, or a lot of people will debate it. But there's a lot of final girls out there, and I want to test your knowledge of some um, final girls, Jason, with what movie they're from and their name. So that's what you're doing next. Okay. Sound exciting? Yeah, very exciting. <laughs> I will also have that up on the screen for everybody else, so as I show them a picture of a final girl, you guys can play at home. Let me know what you... There you're you go. Happy haunting. I love it. You know, I was going to start the show with Welcome Foolish Mortals, but I thought that was a little too a little much. On a little on the nose. It's much more sophisticated. Oh, that. you can tell, right? Yeah, exactly. This is, is the same cobwebs in the Haunted Mansion. Okay, so here we go. And you guys can see that on the screen there, but I'm going to show Jason some final girls, the movie, and their name. And if you don't get their last name, I totally okay. will forgive you. Heather Langenkamp as Nancy. Wow, he's got the actress too. Heather well, Lang coincidentally, uh, before I came here, yeah. I was watching <laughs> Wes Craven's New Nightmare oh, happening yeah. beyond. And New Nightmare's with, not too with, bad. With all due respect to Heather, not the strongest actress. No. Just put that. She's she not, still survived, She's though. not a Jamie Lee. <laughs> no, not at all. All right, so that's uh, what movie is that? Uh, Nightmare, Nightmare on Elm Street. Elm Street yeah. But he got Nancy. Hard one. You'll know oh, the it's, film. Oh, yeah, it's Texas Chainsaw, but I, uh, Marilyn. Uh, He's knowing the actress's name. This I is amazing. You name. know, Marilyn Burns was a yeah, real name, I, but I, she plays. I don't, I don't remember. That's great. It's Sally, but that, that's okay, yeah, yeah. amazing because people tend to forget that one, but it is the slashers you can get. And it's as, about as disturbing. <laughs> disturbing, the absolutely. Is, this that, is the tricky yeah. one, but I have mentioned it. Oh. I honestly don't know. Do you know that actress? She is famous for uh, Romeo and Juliet, actually. Olivia Hussey. Very good. She was also on Death on Nile, one of my favorite movies, just let you know. Uh, yeah, that's Olivia Hussey, so you can see the background, so what's going Black on here. Christmas. It's Black okay. Christmas, yeah. Her name is Jess, and uh, she is the final girl in that. And I think my producer here, LJ, we love that movie, don't we? It was good, yeah. It is good. It was surprisingly good. And it's not one of the, you never, ever, you see the eye yeah. of the, I, I the guy. I think people can that's argue, it. is she actually a final girl? Because you really don't know at the end of the movie, because they don't catch the killer. They don't, and the sad thing is she's the last one left in the house to rest. Yes. And so, there's a phone call, and you're like, okay. <laughs> I would also like to point out that he softened me up with those easy film themes, and then he throws me with some, uh, you know, something like Black Christmas. Like, I, I had said, to throw Black Christmas. I thought we were going to see Janet Lee and Jamie Lee, and like, but no, Olivia Hussey shows up and, you know, and makes me on. look like an idiot. Well, okay, there's, okay so there's, I'm going to throw Laurie Strode Jamie in there. Lee is Jamie Laurie Lee, Strode. yeah, absolutely. Friday the 13th. Don't remember the actress or the name. Um, this is Alice, the character's okay. name, for sure. So Friday the 13th, I, I, I didn't think it would be super tricky for you. I knew throwing Jess in there would be, but Alice is unique because Friday the 13th, of course, not lately. I think it's 1980. 80 it's was 80. the first one. Um, Release she, dates, I'm fine. Final girls, not so <laughs> much. Not so much. Yeah, but Alice is a great final girl. The thing is that in the sequel, she's in it again, but she is killed at the beginning, which happened on occasion yeah. to almost eradicate any trace of what happened <laughs> yeah, in the previous exactly. film, right? But um, The Final Girl, by the way, you can get a fantastic um, piece of original artwork on Final Girl from our sister brand, Collection 82. This Final Girl uh, piece is uh, part of the Collection 82 artwork series of 
pop culture design and illustration made by me, so help me get my thing on your thing. You'll find a description and a link in the bio at the end of the show. Have you had a good time? I've had, had a wonderful time. Well, I promise. I uh, to, no, I, uh, please. Stomped? You got one wrong? <laughs> I know, hey, you knew that. I remember seeing um, Romeo and Juliet in like a high school uh, English class, and they showed her boobs they and showed, his butt. Yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> like, and I was like, nudity and like, Romeo and like, Juliet. Like, I was in ninth grade. I'm like, well, she really is a hussy. <laughs> My <laughs> goodness. Well, you My promised pearls. a review on Halloween Kills. Halloween Please. Kills. Please. Uh, well, it's it's interesting because we live in an era of, of reboots and requels and sidequels and prequels, and oh, that's uh, a lot of names. I turned into Doctor Seuss there for a second. Um, it, Halloween, it gets tricky because uh, a lot of us, especially Gen Xers, hold the uh, 78 original in such high regard. Yeah. I even mentioned earlier that I had trouble with 80s slasher movies because even as a teenager, I'm like, well, this is, this is absurd. This isn't Halloween. This is too easy. Now now you're just going for gross out. I'm not watching. Yeah, you know? yeah. um, and the original Halloween 2... I thought was good, not great. I saw it was, uh, as I mentioned, the second R-rated movie I yeah. saw in the theater, and I think I was just happy to be there. Yeah, R-rated. Um, yeah, but even then, I was like, oh, hypodermic in the eye, <laughs> hammer in the head. It's I think it was the one in the hot tub. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, and I'm like, oh, oh, and that was the one time my dad's like, cover your eyes. He's oh. being a responsible parent. I couldn't see boobs. <laughs> hammer in the right. Isn't that funny? What's important to parents? Right, right. But no areolas. <laughs> I'll say that, um, but uh, you know, even then it was kind of like, as an 11 year old, I, I think I was picking up on that, so he, she's his sister, I feel that kind of, that kind of takes away from the first one, um, but, but uh, it, it's still annual viewing for yeah. me, and then uh, as a 12 year old, I appreciated what they were doing with Season of the Witch, because I, 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 again, I was... That's a debatable film. It's even like, But even at that age, I was sophisticated enough to say, oh, I see what you're doing here. I don't think I agree with it, but, but I see what you're doing. Yeah. And then I remember being in college when The Return of Michael Myers came out, and I was noticeably and visibly offended with the theater. I'm like, <laughs> now you've just thrown it all away. You know, it, it's just, this is another one of your late 80s cheap slasher, yeah. you know, things. Um, and then I can remember how excited I was when H2O came out. I in liked 98. H2O. Loved H2O. Yeah. Um, and that felt like a reasonable continuation of the story because I could see why she would change her name and kind of live with that fear. Recluse. Yeah. So in 2018, when they announced that, okay, we're going to ignore everything beyond the first one and pick up 20 years later, uh, I remember being really excited about that notion of what that kind of trauma would realistically do to person. someone. So I was fascinated from a story perspective about Lori becoming a recluse and kind of the local nut job. Yeah. And Michael she did has, that well. has sort of retreated into almost mythic status, almost like they did with uh, with Luke Skywalker and the Jedi in the mm. Star Wars. Uh, uh, almost mythic, right? It's like, oh, I thought he was a myth. Yes. You know, same thing with Michael Myers. Um, and, and my response to that film was, I wanted to love it, and I just really liked it. And I thought it was good, not great. And um, I, I liked some of the themes they were exploring. Uh, I loved the, 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 the design of the aged mask. Uh, this one I went into uh, with, with, with very high hopes, uh, seeing where they were going to take the story. And uh, it's funny, because I just posted a, a reaction on Facebook today where I said the same thing. Yeah. I said, I went in wanting to love it, I liked it, okay. and it's good, not great. Mostly because I think the uh, the script falls short of some of the ideas that they're trying to put across, okay. like PTSD, uh, mob justice, and the long term effects of trauma and the emotional and mental scarring that take place. But the 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 script doesn't quite get there, and there's some dialogue that it, it, it's just so amateurish, and, and there there are moments that are almost laughably bad and that detracted from the overall experience for me but I will say it's exquisitely shot and there are sh individual shots and scenes that they managed to make Michael Myers even more iconic and horrific than he's ever been that's me. amazing as I sat How there I'm 51 years old and I'm just and I shrank into my seat like oh the shape is still terrifying you know, and Jamie Lee is as great as ever. Um, but but I think it, it 
it falls short of its potential, and I think it falls a little bit short of, of its own aspirations. Yeah. But uh, and I don't know if it's because I'm getting older and, and even more sentimental than, than I've ever been. Um, I have what Steven Spielberg calls a case of terminal nostalgia. So I think there's part of me, and this applies to the Star Wars sequels and Blade Runner 2049. I, there's part of me that is just so happy to spend time in these worlds Worth again and with these characters again that I overlook a lot. Um, but make no mistake, it's still very scary. It is brutally violent. And also, and this touches on our earlier discussion, uh, the kills are more elaborate and creative than anything that was in the original. And I remember having this conversation with uh, Mike Aiello, who's uh, 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 one of the forces behind Halloween Horror Nights oh, today. Yeah. And he made the point, he, uh, he said, yeah, you, you, you almost couldn't make the original Halloween today because the audience, for good or for ill, has evolved to such a point that they wouldn't find that scary. So you almost have to have the over-the-top violence, the blood, the gore. Um, I personally think you could pull off a movie like Halloween today, but it couldn't have a brand name associated with it. It would have to be an original, original. story that people would go into cold to buy the suspense, the the, the lack. There's too much of blood. history with something, and yeah, I feel like yeah, there's too much uh, baggage yeah. coming with it. And uh, because, uh, like we said, if you want to overgeneralize, the original Halloween spawned the slasher genre as we really know it. Um, but it evolved, as we mentioned with Freddy yeah. and Jason, into over-the-top cartoonish level blood and guts. And I don't know that that genre has ever really moved on from that. And I, I think that if you were to do something like Halloween or Psycho or even uh, something like The Shining, which to this day is one of the most terrifying supernatural horror films, ghost stories, ever made. But it wouldn't be looked at. It wouldn't be looked at the same way today, and yet I can't walk down a hotel corridor without anywhere thinking. in the world without thinking, I'm going to turn the corner and there they're going to be. And, you know, that's a really good review. I love that you mentioned the mob mentality real quick, because during the previews and the trailers, I saw that and hoped there would be some development of that. Yeah. And you said there's some good intent, but maybe it doesn't make it all the way. And, and the reason I say it doesn't make it all the way is because there's a couple moments in the movie where that rallying cry, you know, evil dies tonight. <laughs> it, it's like there are moments that start to drift into melodrama yeah. and camp. And in my mind, I'm like, if you had directed that a little differently, I think you could have gotten that emotional uh, relevance I and, we were and, past and, that and resonance that you that you were going yeah. for. And uh, I, I really wasn't a fan of, of what uh, Anthony I think Michael often Hall did. some newer movies, I don't know if they're trying to appease everybody, and I think yeah. they are, because I thought we'd learn not to go to the melodrama camp, especially when you're trying to be as serious as these trailers and Jamie Lee Curtis are trying to be. But I probably will still see it because I'm a big Halloween fan. No, you have to. And you have to see it in the theater. Uh, we love it. I love seeing it with the audience, and, and I'm going to watch it on Peacock again this weekend. So it's it's not that I disliked it by any means. Uh, and there are those uh, there are, uh, there's a decent chunk of the movie that actually takes place in 1978. Uh, so this movie sort that of... That entices me. It is, so this movie waltzes with the 78 original in ways that are emotionally charged and compelling and help recontextualize the events of that film. They don't change them, but they help explain why some of the characters today in this movie do what they do and why they feel the way they do. And that I felt, those moments I think were among my favorite in the, uh, favorites in the film, and they did an amazing job of recreating the look and feel of the 78 original, including characters that, you know, featuring actors that are no longer around to reprise their roles. Oh, see, this is exciting. That's really great. I love that this topic has, you know, we, we the, the being scared is important. I, I think this is the adrenaline rush that we need, and we change over time. What was scary once is, is not anymore, but there are still ways to be scared, but we still go back to some of those originals. It, yeah, and it's a release. I, yeah. You know, we, you mentioned, you touched on it in the beginning of why people like to be scared, and I think it's a... Uh, it's a safe way to deal with our fear because everyone is afraid of something and uh, and those somethings are often all too real. So um, reading a Stephen King novel or going to a horror film or, or even going to a theme park to a Halloween event or even a roller coaster, there, there are ways for us to confront and process our fears that we inherently know, that, that we know are inherently safe. 
that nothing is really going to happen and that gives us the courage to take those things on and then we get that rush, we get that release, we get that catharsis. I know that sounds incredibly pretentious, but no. that really is what scary things do for people. I want to be scared and really quick going back to this haunted attractions, I love a beautifully crafted misdirection because I, I not a lot scares me. There are things that do that are realistic. But when it comes to a fantasy world, give it to me. Give it to me the jump. But I don't want to be, don't make it hokey. And oh, a really good placed distraction and gives me the blood rush that I need to be like, oh God, this was good. So I do like that feeling still. Yeah, but it's absolutely. all about Halloween and we spent a lot of it on Halloween, which is great because it's that time of year. So thank you. You've been a great guest. Everyone's and entitled such... to one good scare. Ooh. Yeah, very good. That's why you're a great guest, and we'll just end it on Charles, there. Because Charles, Charles Cyphers, ladies and gentlemen. How could you end it any way else? Thank you. Did you have a nice time? I had a wonderful time. I appreciate it. Thank you so and they, much they for being here. They broke out the good whiskey, I will say. And only the best for our it wasn't, guests. It wasn't the cheap stuff. They didn't just run down to the quickie mark and grab something off this. This isn't Ripple they gave me. It was a gift. <laughs> Ripple, that was uh, Sanford and Son. Oh. I mean, I'm the, chill, but the, I don't think the, I was paying the attention Fox to the... Was always asking for the as a kid, I was probably like, it's probably candy. I don't know. Right. <laughs> Guys, thanks for joining us. Please tune in next time. And if you want to learn a little bit more about Jason, please check in the description. We'll kind of link you to where his site is and what he's done. And maybe you can reach out and stalk him. But why not? Why you not? Show up in a mask. Or if, 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 you're, if you're a girl and have a twin, then you know how to scare me. Go to a hotel and wait for him around <laughs> the corner. Just wait for me to turn the corner. Say goodbye, Jason. Goodbye, Jason. Until next time, everybody.